the title of this is The Most Human Human, and I want to spend a moment giving some context for that. Uh, Alan Turing, the British mathematician and pioneer of computer science, posited that if you interacted um, blindly with a machine and it gave answers you could not distinguish from those of a human, effectively you were interacting with an intelligence. And this became known as the Turing test and kind of the threshold for artificial intelligence. And it's become a, uh, a standard by which artificial intelligence is uh, judged. Unfortunately, it's also become kind of a, a thing to spoof. Most recently, uh, a guy uh, fooled people into thinking that a machine was a 14-year-old in Germany tweeting at them. And it really wasn't artificial intelligence. Turing had something much deeper in mind. And that speaks to what my, our, the speaker, Brian Christian, um, is after when he looked at the Turing test, which is really a question of what makes humans humans? And what can the behavior of machines tell us about what makes human humans? Um, why don't you talk a little bit about what Turing was pointing at, what it became, and how this illuminates being human? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Turing, you know, Turing is writing, he comes up with this idea of what he, he calls the imitation game. We now call it the Turing test. Um, in 1950, and, and so one of the things that I think, as setting the historical context for that, that is really interesting and surprising, is that in the paper that he's writing, uh, the word computer does not exist as a word that he expects his readers to know. Um, and so he has to actually explain what a computer is to his readers, and when you read the paper, there's this very uncanny thing, which is he says, you can imagine this machine, he says, as being kind of like a computer. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's invoking the word computer in its pre-1950 sense, which was a job description. Mm -hmm. So the word computer from uh, the 1700s up to the end of World War II meant a human being who does mathematical calculations for a living. And so, you know, if you read, for example, the biographies of... Um, you know, for example, Claude Shannon, one of these, these great mathematical pioneers in the early 20th century, um, you'll see something like, Claude Shannon met his wife at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. He was an engineer and she was a computer. Um, and so the, the engineer-computer romance was actually this extreme <laughs> to get with the program. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's quite fascinating, or you'll see these archival photos of like Richard Feynman in a room full of computers, yeah. and it's him and you know thirty young women or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nonetheless, um, the Turing test and what was called the most human human contest was an actual uh, series of events where people were trying to judge: Am I talking to a machine? Am I talking to a human? And what are some of the illuminations that came from that? How do you tell what a human is? Yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, that's, that's obviously, like, an enormous question. Um, you know, the, so the, Turing first comes up with this idea as, as this philosophical thought experiment in the 50s, and um, it stays basically in the realm of academia for a couple decades um, until uh, in the 1990s it becomes an actual annual contest. Um, so there's this... Uh, eccentric uh, millionaire disco dance floor salesman from New Jersey. Uh, I'm not making it. So, um, that's human. <laughs> who endows this thing, it names it after himself, the Loebner Prize. And so it, every year since the early 90s, there has been this contest where we convene a panel of scientists and have them uh, entering into these chat rooms uh, with one computer program and one human being. Uh, exchanging dialogue for five minutes trying to tell who's who. Yes, and I think that the critical thing is exchanging dialogue. Right. One of the interesting things is the way we exchange dialogue and the way machines exchange dialogue, what you call half and versus full duplex. Yeah, right. Spend a minute on that. Sure, yeah. So um, there are these terms that I first encountered um, in the language of kind of signal processing uh, that are half duplex and full duplex. 
And you can think of these in terms of uh, what it's like to have a conversation on a walkie-talkie, where uh, in a walkie-talkie, only one person can be controlling the channel at, at a time, and you explicitly yield that channel over to the other person. So this is called half-duplex. Um, full duplex, in contrast, is what it's like to be on the phone, where there's just this open channel going in both directions and people can cross talk and cut each other off and all these Right, things. and the Turing test is very much a half duplex kind of It really is. You a question, you'll give me an answer, and it would be more interesting if the machine said, oh God, you're asking me that again. Yeah, you know, yeah. It would be anticipating who you are and it wouldn't mind annoying you and it would be trying to take it some other direction. Absolutely, yeah. So, um, you know, Turing, in, in many ways, uh, one of the lamentable things is that the conversations that Turing fantasizes about in his 1950 paper are tragically so much richer than the actual transcripts of the Loebner Prize. So Turing imagines asking these, uh, his interlocutors to spontaneously write a sonnet or solve some riddle or something like that. But if you look at the Loebner Prize transcripts, they, they resemble kind of an awkward speed date. To the, extent they, <laughs> yeah, to the extent they have emotional capability, it's very contrived. Yeah, and it's and it's there's a stilted um, kind of you know oh so did you travel far to get here? You know, Tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leading yeah. questions like that that right. Well, the therapists use those, but yeah. well, and the, the original the original chatbot um, is a program uh, from the late 1960s called Eliza that was written by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT, and it was designed explicitly as a parody of this kind of non-directive Rogerian therapist. So you would say, you know, I'm feeling sad, and it would just sort of pluck the keyword and say, I'm sorry to hear you are feeling sad. Tell me what is making <laughs> right. you sad. And the funny thing is, people would interact with Eliza and said, don't stop the experiment. I want to keep going. This thing understands me so well. Yeah. And really, they were just looking in a mirror. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, famously, uh, Weizenbaum's own secretary is having these extremely long, intimate exchanges, and he's warning her, like, you know that I have a keylogger installed, like, I'm going to read everything that you're saying, like, you probably don't want to get too personal. And, and despite his insistence to her, like, you watched me write this program in front of you, like, you know that there's no, nothing, there's no man behind the curtain or whatever, um, there was just this irresistible, a uh, tendency for people that were interacting with Eliza to really just spill their heart out. Um, and in fact, it horrified Joseph Weizenbaum so much that he does this thing which is basically unheard of in academia, which is he, he yanks his own funding, cancels the project, and completely uh, basically pulls a 180 of his entire career. And for the rest of his career until his death in 2008, he becomes one of the most outspoken critics of AI. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But in some sense, it was too late. So it's like you let the, the genie out of the bottle. Well, I, I think the, the distinction to, to circle back, which is another thing humans do that machines aren't very good at. <laughs> right. To circle back, um, the full duplex is an interaction with others. And yeah. that's a big difference between humans and machines. Others matter because we're going to give them something, lead them into some mutual kind of communion, and that will help us and we'll feel something for that. In some ways, you could argue that saying something interesting is, is a deeper problem than saying something true. Um, Ooh, be say <laughs> because um, say that again. <laughs> to say so, yeah. So you know we we think about this. Um, you know, we we imagine a, a problem like the Turing test as you ask someone a question and you expect a, a correct answer or like a, a statement that makes a valid proposition about the world as it exists. But in many ways, it's deeper to expect an interesting answer. And the reason is that I, communication at its best requires what's called theory of mind. So mm -hmm. you need to not only have a model of the world that constrains your ability to say things that are you know, true, but you also need a model of your listener. And so it's why, um, you, know, it's, it's why you, can, you can deeply offend someone by telling them something boring, like, um, money can be exchanged for goods and services. Um, that, the reason that that's insulting is it sort of points to this deep truth about communication, which is that we say things that we expect to be informative to the person we're saying them to. Mm -hmm. And so to say something really dumb 
to set the person is a way of insulting them by saying like, you'll find this informative. You're right. Um, Here's something you're not equipped with yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. um, and Claude Shannon, uh, one of the founders of information theory, he invents the idea of, of binary. Um, he is the first person to come up with this idea of mathematic, a, a mathematical theory of communication. Um, and basically what Claude Shannon starts to think of all, all interaction as being a, a, a kind of um, playing, playing the game hangman, where your listener is always trying to anticipate or guess what you're trying to say. And the more informative the conversation is, the more uh, the listener's guesses will be wrong. And so this seems like a fairly abstract idea when he publishes it in the 40s, but we now have probably the most literal incarnation that the human race has ever had of, of this idea of Shannon entropy, which is that, um, you know, as of iOS 8, which came out three, four weeks ago, um, anyone with an iPhone, I mean, Android has already had this, but anyone with an iPhone, um, you're literally getting the phone anticipating the next word and mm -hmm. offering you these three choices. So you see these screenshots of someone typing, I love you, and it, it offers at the bottom, you know, I love you man, I love you honey, I love you babe, and you sort of pick, like, from this very limited menu, what um, term of endearment you are going to apply to your Wow, and pretty soon a lot of little backs were judging you and saying, this is a, this is a man, not babe situation, so. Yeah, 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 right. It'll, it'll know your behaviors and start to anticipate things. Absolutely, so yeah, I mean, um, the more sophisticated these models get, the more they can start to infer, you know, oh, you use um, a formal register with this person, so you call, you know, uh, say thank you instead of like thanks, dude, or something. Like that. So you know, others matter to us in a way that they they don't typically to machines, although that may become encoded somehow. Yeah. Um, is Twitter um, half duplex or full duplex? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Twitter, in some ways, is you know reducing reducing communication, obviously down to 140 characters. That's kind of the, the business model, but but we've now reduced it to, you know, the ditto mark, where the most, the most common thing to do on Twitter is just to point to something someone else said and say, yeah. Right. Right, that's what we, we retweeting. Or the app called Yo. Yeah, yes, right. Are like, you familiar single, with this? There is, a, there is an app where you just send someone a Yo. And that's... That's the entire interface. <laughs> it's worth millions. <laughs> yes, yeah, they, yeah, they've, they've raised the millions of um, and I think in some ways the, the, one of the epithets of the current internet is, is the sentence, this, period. Right. Someone will read like a 12,000 word essay and then they'll comment on it and just go, this. Yeah. The point of time. <laughs> but in pointing at them, they're saying something about themselves, I think. Yes. That's, that's right. something that the machine wouldn't be doing. It's, it is something to say I've chosen this and I, it resonates with me in yeah. some way, um, but of course you're 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 not elaborating on that. Or in some ways, much of social media is leveraging off something very deep. You know? Yeah. They just found, I think last week they published. They'd found another cave painting from thirty-five thousand years ago, forty, and they found the thing they always find in caves of ten and twenty and thirty and forty thousand years ago, which is a handprint. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it's just someone saying, "Here I am." You know, this was me. Yeah, you know, they they blew ochre over their hand and left their mark. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if, as much as we have this kind of urgency to pass on our DNA, we have other urgency to sort of mark ourselves in the world and show we made a difference. Yeah, and that's what the this is, or that's what a yo is. Yeah, I I I agree completely that there's something like extremely um, primal and, and profound about about the idea of wanting to stamp yourself on something. And what's troubling is that we've now created interfaces that, um, you know, effectively remove the handprint from the outline of the hand. Yeah. You know, there's a button that has a picture, you know, uh, some sort of clip art of a hand on it. <laughs> Yeah. And everyone clicks the same button and gets the same handprint. Right. <laughs> right. Or it's like I was here, like in you know Helvetica, like 
Um, so you get the dopamine squirt of self-actualization without actually the trouble of going through it. Right, right. Everyone's, everyone's handprint is exactly identical. And right. Yeah, that's very troubling. So yeah, I mean, I, I, got an, I got an email the other day from a friend of mine who says, hey, oh, I was, I, I was reading some stuff and I thought you might be interested in this, this, and this. And each word this was a hyperlink. And I clicked the hyperlink and each was uh, the full text of a like 500 page book. Three different books. And so I was thinking to myself, you know, rather than having like a really interesting 45 minute conversation over beer where they distill like what was interesting to them or what they believed would be interesting right. to me. They were saying, why don't you just take a long weekend and read like yeah. <laughs> And I think that's like, at, at the heart of it, we've, we've, we've now hit this really troubling part with the mediums of communication that we use in which it's, for the first time ever, easier to transmit the entire text <laughs> of the thing that we've read rather than somehow summarize it or distill it into into a bit of communication. Yeah, I mean, for, for the longest time, people had a, a had five books, ten books, yeah, right. but they read them very, very deeply and they sat with them. Yeah. You know, and now you have everything Amazon has in your Kindle potentially, but you're just skipping to the next thing. That's a, an interesting kind of distinction. I don't know whether that makes it more or less. In terms of humanity, though, yeah. Um, another thing that humans seem to be good at, tied to that, that need to tweet and that need to put up the handprint, is uh, desire and necessity. Yes. You know, the, the, a computer can play chess and a computer can be Casper on the chess, but a computer doesn't sit there and go, God, I'm kind of bored right now, maybe chess would help. And right. that's sort of an interesting distinction, too, between humans and machines, that we have finite time and that matters to us. Yes. So we need to fill it with sensation and novelty. And we are the prime mover of our own actions, right? So That's why we seek others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and the, the harshest punishment that our civilization can impose, short of death, is just putting you by yourself. Right. Um, Banishment, isolation, solitary confinement. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Solitary confinement is considered like the worst thing you can do to someone. Um, and uh, I mean, this gets back, this sort of circles back to what we, we had begun to say about the idea of half duplex conversation, full duplex conversation. That um, in a chat room and in, in, in a more sort of formal QA style thing, you have basically this half duplex situation where everyone is queuing the end of their turn and saying, okay, now you speak. And that's, I mean, that's how computer software is, is written, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you make an explicit request, hit the enter key, which is like the walkie-talkie version of saying over, and then it computes for however long is necessary to compute, and it's typically unresponsive to input during that time, and then comes back at you and says, here's what you asked for, now I'm entering like this receptive waiting state again. Um, if you look at, um, human beings in natural and formal settings, if you get three or four people together over drinks, um, you see something that is completely unlike that. Mm -hmm. And basically there's kind of a single stream of communication. Everyone is participating. It's rare that someone will get through an entire sentence. Um, and I, I have such self-control just letting you do this. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so this, this and they came to see you. Yeah, no, this is a perfect example. So. Um, the thing that really surprised me as I started uh, digging into some of like the communication theory literature and so forth is um, the historical thing about the Turing test is framed entirely in terms of what do you say or what is the answer to some query or something. But conversation in the wild is so much more about when do you speak up and how long do you continue. Mm -hmm. When do you interrupt? When do you yield? Mm -hmm. um, and as we said, you know, it's extremely informed by this theory of mind of uh, what you think your listener is going to find interesting. You know, so you get these situations where one person is saying, okay, but let me just interrupt for a second, and then the second person is like, no, but let me just persist right. because what I'm about to say is more interesting than I think you think it's going to be. <laughs> right, so humanity is empathy, it's desire, it's taste. These are all these things that 
when we talked about the when Turing talked about his machine, he was hoping it might acquire these capabilities, or he was wondering if it would replace. Is there a converse? Are the machines we're interacting with so closely making us more like them? Absolutely. I mean, there's one of the most heartbreaking things that I read in the last several years from the perspective of literature was I was reading the biography of David Foster Wallace, and there's just a there's a a bunch of amazing quotes that are pulled out of his letter writing correspondence with Jonathan Franzen. They're just sending each other these like enormous letters. I mean, you can imagine how enormous the letters must have been. <laughs> um, and there's just this exquisitely heartbreaking footnote by um, Wallace's biographer that says, Wallace is probably the last great letter writer of mm. American English. Because after he and friends and get email accounts in the year 2000, their correspondence like completely dries up, yeah. and never and it and it becomes a, this clipped monotone. Tell me what you think. It's a hot link to the corrections. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thought of you. Wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This infinite wall. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, we have a couple of minutes. Let's take some questions from the audience. Sir? Um, sir? Oh, okay, the mic is coming down. This one? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Everybody gets a shot. So I, I heard, I read this, I'm not sure it's true, that it's a harder problem in artificial intelligence to have a hand pick up a chess piece and move it than it is to win a chess game. And, <laughs> yes. And so, so the real test then is of whether something's human is will you dance? Um, anyway, could you comment on that? Dancing is the other mind. Yeah. I, um, it, broadly, this concept is known as Moravec's paradox, um, which, in a nutshell, is everything that we think is hard is easy, and everything we think is easy is hard. Um, and so you, you've gotten this extremely strange narrative when you look at the progression of AI, which is uh, AI begins conquering fields that we consider to be the domains of human expertise and is working its way back towards things that infants can do. So, you know, the, the cutting edge of AI is like, here's a picture of a dog, is this a picture of a dog, yes or no? Um, the things that three and four year olds can do, or like, here's a thing at the end of the room, walk across the room without smashing all of the, you know, vases and pick it up without crushing it. Um, and I think there's a sort of an evolutionary story there, which is that the very reason that we perceive ourselves to be good at these things is because we've been designed to do them. Um, what I find really kind of satisfying from a philosophical perspective is there's this 2,500 year old narrative, uh, going back at least as far as Aristotle, that's like uh, obsessed with this question of what are humans uniquely capable of? And Aristotle answers the question uh, by saying contemplation, which is a, a very convenient answer for a professional philosopher. Too. <laughs> um, and but but really the trend is is to say humans must be uniquely good at the things that animals cannot do. And so like we we immediately write off all of these kind of real world embedded real time things like you know, staying upright on two legs, walking through an environment, um, interacting with others. And so, in some ways, what I think of as the, the really great humanizing narrative of AI is it's turned, the, you know, two and a half millennia of thinking on this question completely on its head and, and said, in fact, it appears to be the case that many of the most complex cognitive things that human beings do are the things that animals do. So it is precisely that part of our brain that it Well, Aristotle also said something, I think, very deep about AI when he says the measure of poetic genius is the ability to make metaphor. Yes. Which is the ability to sort of see commonality among things that are sort of diametrically opposed. When you say flesh is grass, well, flesh is nothing like grass. Flesh is flesh. But yes. in fact, you're saying something very deep about our existence. And for a machine to get there would be a massive breakthrough. Absolutely. Um, we're at the clock, but let's just take one more question. Sure. We'll run Push a little bit. Yes. Yeah, just, um, one of the words that you've not used in, in your conversation today is contradiction. And I think humans are, I think, inherently. No, we don't. <laughs> 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 inherently, you know, uh, 
<laughs> organisms that have contradictions in almost everything we do. And, and for a computer to really uh, be or human-like, we we'll have to therefore have inherent contradictions like we do. And would that be, in fact, totally diametrically opposite to uh, the concept of computing and concept mm. of logic and everything else? The yeah. second, second thing I want to, on a different note, uh, is, is in this modern world that I don't quite fully participate in, uh, <laughs> I don't have a Twitter account and I don't have any of those things, is, is it that we now do not have the time to think mm. that Aristotle, Aristotle requested that we should identify ourselves with thinking and you know we're constantly responding. My children uh, yeah. who, are, who are in the, in the 30s and 20s, uh, all they do now is respond, react. Right. And is that a concern that your generation is, is, should worry about? Yeah. And should um, you keep that answer short? Yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you a partial and possibly unsatisfying answer, but hopefully the can answer this. So the first thing about contradiction, I mean the, the first thing that comes to my mind is you know the the truly um, fundamental result in computability theory is is Gödel's incompleteness theorem, right, from from the mid 20th century, and the basic idea of that is that it's impossible for a formal system to be both complete and consistent. Um, it's it's impossible to basically you either have to have true things that you're not capable of expressing or false things that you are capable of expressing. And so viewed from this completely abstract, like formal logic point of view, contradiction is kind of the, um, the inescapable baggage of, ha of a certain level of complexity. Um, how, how directly or how applicable is Gödel's incomplete to the human brain is an open question. I'm not qualified to answer it. But, um, as to this question of, you know, are we, are, have we lost the ability to just have idle thoughts? Um, I'm, I'm reminded a little bit of there's a crisis. Um, there's a crisis right now in the internet that is called buffer bloat. Um, and the idea is that uh, the TCP protocol that runs the internet is based on the idea that when you get overloaded, you just drop things, right? You drop packets. And uh, we've accidentally built all of the routers that run the internet with buffers that are too large, which means that they never drop packets. So um, it used to be, you know, if, if you if you see a celebrity walking through a crowd, everyone's trying to get their attention, but most people just fail. But now what happens if you're famous is you get like tens of thousands of email a day, and the emails just sit there and wait for you. Um, so in some ways, we are now experiencing like the human buffer bloat that by using these media that will just sort of persist these thing, things to read or things to do or people trying to get in touch with us. Um, it used to be that people would try to get in touch with you, they'd call you up and you wouldn't pick up and then that, the call would fail. Um, now we have, to, we have to call a person back some days later and, and apologize. Okay, well Brian, <laughs> thank you so much. Man. Market things where people exchange goods for currency. Oh, yeah. <laughs>